أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالسخور ميدانا أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل ربي يدخلني مدخل صدق وأخرجني مخرج صدق وجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. <clears throat> we then begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful would begin many of his by advising us, Usikum ibadallah bi taqwallah, that I advise you, the servants of God, to be God conscious, God fearing and pious human beings. We have been on the subject of theology and last week we began the discussion regarding proving the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said in the subject of theology, naturally there are many ways of proving His existence, but we generally concentrate on three. And the first one that we started with was the proof of necessary existence, which is the proof of wajib al-wujud, the existence, al-wujud, whose existence is necessary, wajib. In these existence or the discussion of existence, there are two types of existences. There is something which is possible for it to be in existence and something which is necessary. A possible existence is an existence that does not exist on its own. Yeah? Rather, its existence is dependent upon something else to bring it into existence. We said the def- example of a possible existence is you and I. That we did not exist on our own. It took our parents to come together to bring us into existence. Therefore, there was a time when we did not exist. And after that, something brought us into existence. This is known as a possible existence. On the other side, there is a necessary existence. A necessary existence is an existence which exists on its own. It is not dependent upon anything else for its existence. And because it is not dependent upon anything else for its existence, it means that it has no beginning nor does it have an end. It is something which has always existed. Right? Anytime something brings something into existence, it by definition no longer can be called a necessary existence. So now we have proved that there is a necessary existence, or we have defined rather what is a necessary existence and what is a possible existence. And when it comes to the realm of existences then, there's only three possibilities based on those definitions. One, everything is a possible existence. Two, everything is a necessary existence. And number three, there are some existences which are necessary and some which are possible. So logically there are only three possibilities. That's where we left off last week. Let's continue a little bit forward. Um, 
the, uh, when it comes to how to discuss each possibility, let's look at the first one. The first one is that every existence is a necessary existence. Again, these definitions sometimes are wordy, but they're important to grain in. A necessary existence, we said, is something that always existed, that is not dependent upon any other existence to exist. This possibility, I think, is very easy to refute. Because when we look at our own existence, we accept that we are not a necessary existence. And therefore, because you and I are not necessary existences, because this stick, something had to mold it and create it, something had to mold and create this podium, all of these are examples that we have necessary, uh, non-necessary existences all around us. And therefore, the first possibility that everything is a necessary existence is very easy to say this is impossible. And so we eliminate that very quickly, that it's impossible for all existence to be necessary. We now come to the second point, or the second possibility, and that is that every existence is a possible existence. That every existence is a mumkin al-wujud. Right? Now how do we refute this or how do we fight this? The first thing that we again have to understand is the definition. Right? So a possible existence is something that does not exist on its own. I am not in existence on my own. Rather, not just my creation was dependent. Right? Even till today, I am dependent. I am dependent on air. I am dependent on food, I am dependent on so many things. If these external factors get shut off from me, my existence ceases to exist. You take away oxygen from me, I will die, right? And therefore my existence by definition is a dependent existence, right? And so how can we prove that it, it is not possible for all existences to be possible existences? You all with me? Inshallah, yeah? The impossibility of this possibility, Subhan, I got to come up with better words, you know. The impossibility of this, this clause that all existences are um, possible existences can be proven through two means, right? The first is that if all existences were possible, this would mean that each of them would require a cause to bring it into existence, correct? We established this. So for something to be a possible existence, something had to bring it into existence. That means it required an illa, it required a cause to bring its effect into reality. If this is the case, that means that there has to be, for my existence, something which brought me into existence. So let's just look at me as an example. I was brought into existence by my parents. They were brought into existence by their parents. Right? How far do we go back? Right? And so to try to see whether or not it's possible for all existences to be possible. And so you can say, well, their grandparents were brought by their parents and their parents and their parents. And we go back and we can go all the way back to Adam. Salam. Right? And we can trace it, trace it, trace it. This is why we're all Bani Adam. Right? Was Adam a necessary existent? Huh? Was his existence always there? It wasn't. Therefore, even Adam required a cause to bring it into existence. Yeah? And this continued regression of possibilities is known as tasalsul, an infinite chain of regression. And an infinite chain of regression is impossible. There has to be a beginning to this chain. And if there is something that is the beginning of that chain, that existence could not have been brought by any other existence. Therefore, by default, the original creation had to come from a necessary existent. Right? You get it? This is really nice, right? Because you can't keep going back. This is like a chain. Yeah, if you have a chain, it's known as tasalsul, but if you take the example of a chain, like a metal chain, they're interlocked with each other. But there is one chain that starts off the connection. You can't just have an infinite chain, right? And similarly, when it comes to existences, you can't have an infinite regression of possible existences. It has to start somewhere. And if we agree that it starts somewhere, but yet that existence also dependent, then we need something else. And so there has to come a start. When there has to be an existence which is, not bring, which is not dependent upon any other existence. And therefore, by default, it is impossible to have an infinite chain of regression. And therefore, it is impossible to have all existences which are possible. Right. Good? 
Yeah, inshallah. This is why we record these lectures. You can go back and listen to them, inshallah. But these points are important, right? Again, like I said, the reason for proving these things is what, right? It's not so I can debate some people. I, it doesn't matter, right? So that I can debate shaitan when shaitan tries to put a doubt in my head. That there is no God. And I'd be like, no, let me prove to you why there has to be an existence which is necessary. These points are important, right? Yes, maybe our children will need them, maybe we will need them. But the most important reason for these proofs is to solidify our own Iman. Yeah? It's one thing to believe in something, remember. But it's one thing entirely when I can prove why I believe in that thing. Right? And so these proofs are essential. And so the first way of proving that not every existence can be possible is by looking at the, kind, the, the, the definition that an infinite chain of regression, which is known as tasalsul, is impossible. And so there has to be a start to it. Another way of also looking at this, if one says that forget a chain, let's look at a circle. Right? Let's say A created B. And then B created C, right? But then let us also say C created A. Yeah, you understand? So like we're looking at a circle and say, but look, we, we don't have to go in a chain. We can just say A created B, B created C, C created D. But if we keep going E, F, G, then we just get a bigger and a bigger circle. But for a circle to connect, it has to go back to? A, ahsantum, yeah? And so we can, someone may argue that A created B, B created C, C created A. And then that means that at the same time, A was in existence and not in existence at the same time. Isn't it? Right? And this is what's known as a vicious circle or dour. And even a dour is impossible because two things, one thing cannot be two diametrically opposed characteristics at the same time. A cannot be not in existence and existence at the same time. And therefore, through, to this, through these two proofs, we conclude then that all existences cannot be possible existences. So we have disproved, number one, that all existences cannot be necessary. We have disproved, number two, that all existences cannot be possible. And therefore, the only possibility that we are left with is that there are some existences that are wajib, and some existences that are mumkin. Yeah? And this is where we will continue next week because we have now proved that there has to be a necessary existence. The next step in this journey is to prove why there can only be one necessary existence and not multiple necessary existence. So far, we haven't even talked about God yet. Yeah? We're just trying to prove that there has to be an existence that is independent of everyone else. And our next step, inshallah, is try to prove that why there can only be one such existence in creation. Wa akhiru da'awan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahi rahman rahim Qul huwa Allahu ahadun illahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. Sadaq Allahu al-aliyu al-azim. Salli ala أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام اللهم صل على وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة 
اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي صل على محمد وآل محمد صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد We start the second sermon by remembering our brothers and sisters throughout the world going through extreme difficulties and hardships all parts of the world locally and abroad there are people and communities who are in dire need and it's important that we remember them with our prayers and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal, especially for our brothers and sisters in Gaza and the West Bank now as well, um, and Rohingya and all places throughout the world from Sudan. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to relieve them of their difficulties and hardships and to bring an awakening in the hearts of our world leaders to, real, to accept and realize that this type of brutality is unaccepted. And inshallah, they can bring some type of change with the push from the grassroots as well. It feels odd to continue to something else, but there are many things that we also need to address as a community. And Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we had a very good summer with our children and with our grandchildren and nephews and nieces. And I want to spend today just as our kids go back to school, um, this is a huge change within the home. You know, Alhamdulillah, we get, thing, we get used to things very quickly. When the kids came home, it was odd. And now they go back to school and it's odd. And so as our kids go back to school, be it an Islamic school or homeschooling or other types of schools, I just want to give some advice to now the adults who are in the room um, to, re to accept and realize that there are certain responsibilities that we have um, regardless of the connection we have to our children, that how do we um, ensure that we fulfill our divine responsibilities. The first advice is that it's very important that we are involved in the learning process of our children. You know, as I'm speaking to men, I know there are women, but sometimes by default we give the rearing of our children and the raising of our children and maybe even in certain extents the education of our children to our wives and mothers. Uh, we are not not responsible. We are all responsible. Allah is not just going to ask the women that how did you rear your children, but Allah will ask us as well, did you take an active part in making sure that your children had akhlaq, to make sure that your children knew the dangers of this world and therefore we all have a responsibility to be very involved in our lives of the young people within our homes and so it doesn't matter um, their age, you know, be involved. Involved is different than dictating, you know. We don't have to dictate for them what to do. We, we can't tell, especially when they become a bit older, when they become in their late teens or early twenties or even after that, we can't tell them where to go, where to live, where to buy. But at the same time, we can still learn to be involved in our children's lives, right? Um, and sometimes I know as parents, we want our kids to call us, especially when they go to university and we say, look, our children don't even call us. I'll call them. You have a phone too, yeah? And I know it'd be nice to have them call us and, and remember us. But at the same time, we can also pick up the phone and humble ourselves just to make sure that we're involved in our children's lives, just to find out what is happening. And especially as our kids are younger, we have to know what they are being exposed to. You know, a lot of the learning, if not most of the learning, does not take place in the classroom. Yeah? It takes place when they are out playing with their friends, when they're out in the gym, when they're out in different places and the kids are talking. That is when our kids are learning new language, learning new ideas, learning new things. And it's really important that as parents we are active and, and know what our children are learning and at the same time being patient in what challenges they bring to our door. It's very easy to become confrontational, right? But if we become confrontational with our kids and put our foot down, they'll go somewhere else. 
Yeah, so we have to learn to humble ourselves in this process so that we can have a good relationship with our children. And again, like I think what's, what we have to also realize is that like the way we treat our children, it, it's being absorbed into them. Yeah? And they will then end up treating their children in a very similar manner. This is not something that generationally skips. So if I am rough with my kids and, and harsh with my kids, it's quite possible that they'll turn out the same way. You know? And so we have to learn that everything that we do has an effect. And so the first thing that I would really advise all of us here, please be involved. Yeah? Be involved in what our children are learning. Um, and what they're going through. Number two, it's really important as well that we do not forget that we have a responsibility to teach them Islam and Islamic values. Right? Um, sometimes we concentrate very highly on secular knowledge and put a lot of emphasis on their grades and what classes they're taking and this is all important. But I don't think God will ask us what grades we got in school. Yeah? Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us whether or not we safeguarded each other from the fire of Jahannam. Yeah? What did we do to protect each other? You know, there's a really powerful hadith that's reported from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Where he says, Waylun, Waylun li awlad akhir zaman min abaihim. He says, Woe to the children of the last times because of their fathers. Because of their fathers, woe to these kids. And so the companions asked, why? Is it because their fathers were kafir, mushrik, non-believers? And he said, no, they were believing fathers. Yeah? But they did not teach them what was obligatory in the eyes of Allah. Rather, whenever the children wanted to learn, they focused their energies elsewhere. Our children want to become better, saying, no, spend time concentrating on school, spend time doing this. And we forget the Islamic principles, right? It's really important that we teach our children the basics. Yeah? The basics is the minimum. They should all know how to read the Qur'an. Yeah? They should all know what Allah expects from them. Right? It's, not, it's not right for us to raise a kid who becomes 18, 20, 21, and they still do not know how to read the Qur'an. It's not the kid's fault, yeah? it's the parent's fault. Right? And so when you look at our kids in madrasa today, many of them are in the later grades, but they still don't know how to read the Qur'an. And you find that they will blame the madrasa. But the madrasa teaches them one hour a week for 26 weeks. That's 26 hours, and you divide that by 20 children in a classroom, we're giving each kid four minutes. What can the kid learn in four minutes? Right? But they're home the entire other time. Teach them Qur'an. And you know what? If I as a parent don't know how to read Qur'an, then this is a good time we both learn Qur'an together. Right? But learn Qur'an. Teach them the ahkam. What is wajib? What is haram? And then teach them akhlaq. These are our responsibilities and Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us about if not we fulfilled these responsibilities. And the last advice that I give us today is that we have to lead by example. Yeah? We have to lead by example. So we can't tell our kids to do one thing and then we're doing something else. If we want less screen time from our kids, we should be on the screen less. Yeah? If we want, for example, our kids to pray on time, they should pray on, we should pray on time. If we want our kids to read Qur'an more, they should see us reading the Qur'an. Um, and even reading, exercising, whatever. The parents have to be involved in these things so the kids are motivated. I'll end with this hadith where our first Imam salam says, one who appoints himself as a leader of the people must first begin by educating himself before educating others. He must discipline through his own behavior before disciplining with his tongue. We as the adults are the leaders of our families. Yeah? We have to grow ourselves and become better so that our kids and the future generations can become better. These three things I leave you with as our kids start a school year. Uh, number one, be involved in what they're learning. Number two, don't forget the Islamic values. And number three, lead by example. And inshallah, if we do these things, at the end of the day, the kid's going to become who the kid becomes. Yeah? But in the eyes of God, at least I cannot be held accountable for not doing my job. Right? The kid will make his own decisions as they grow up. 
and they're not a kid anymore at that point. There's a certain time when we as adults are no longer responsible for the actions of our children. But prior to that, everything they do later is dependent on what we did in the beginning. And so I hope we take the time and the efforts to put in what is necessary so that we can create good future generation and leaders going forward. عن الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم